That's one of my favorite songs, maybe every time I get the chance. And yet I was challenged this past week, I read a quote that said, if you want to hear some of the greatest lies, sit in a church on Sunday mornings and listen to the singing. <laughs> and I thought, first of all, I was like, excuse me? And I thought, man, that is kind of true, isn't it? Because this is one of my favorite songs. This world is not my home. And yet, how many Christians sing that song, and this world is very much their home? This world is not my home, and yet we're freaking out about DC. <laughs> this world is not my home, and yet I'm stressed out because of fill in the blank. This world is not my home, and yet we lose sight of the kingdom. And the reason why Bob did not pick that song, I did not tell Bob to pick that song. It fits in perfectly with the sermon, though. Because we're going to finish the last act of Solomon's life this morning. In the last several years, when a plane goes down, what does everybody look for? The black box. You know, there's this magical black box that apparently cannot be destroyed. I don't know what it's made of, I don't know how it works, but apparently it's built to survive the ter most terrible, craziest, fiery accidents, and they look for this black box. I heard a comedian say one time, the black box survives. Why don't they build the whole plane out of the black box? So, you know, they want to look for the black box, but they look for this box, and then the FAA gets it, and they go back and they can literally step back in time and listen to what happened before the plane went down. They can kind of take a, a ghost car, if you will, a ghost trip back and, and hear what the pilot was saying and, and hear what was going on in the cockpit and, and hear the conversation between the pilot and the tower. And the reason why they do all this is so that they can try to figure out what happened and in the hopes that it won't happen again in the future to try to save some other plane the same fate or even you know, try to just fix a problem in the future. Every one of us sitting here this morning has a black box. We, it's not physical, you can't see it, but we have a black box. We have those moments, those experiences, those uh, times in our lives where we learn a lesson, where something happened, and we use those to draw from and say, we have to avoid this at all costs in the future. We have this black box that helps us avoid problems, that helps us avoid mistakes. Most importantly, we have a black box that can help others avoid the same mistakes. Where we can go and say, listen, let me go back in time and tell you about when I made that choice. Don't do that. Don't go down that path. Solomon had a black box. And that's the last act of Solomon's life. I call it the last lecture of the wise man. It is a moment where he goes and he opens up his black box and he looks back at life and he ends up saying, nothing has worth. Everything is meaningless. It's called Ecclesiastes. And it is a very black box. He comes to the end of his life. We already looked at the first act when it was wisdom. He asked God for wisdom. God grants him all the wisdom he can have. And then the riches and the power and everything else. And wisdom says... Uh, listen to the Lord. And then last week we looked at the second act, and that is passion. Solomon had passion, just misplaced passion. We said last week that wisdom and passion go hand in hand. Passion says, run after love. And Jesus says, yeah, run after love. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others as yourself. This week Solomon comes and he opens up his black box and he says, everything is meaningful. If you remember a, a few years ago, I guess about three years ago or so, I, I spent several weeks walking through Ecclesiastes, and, and several of you had comments to say, these are the most depressing sermons I've ever heard. Well, because sometimes Ecclesiastes is not the most uplifting, the most encouraging book. I mean, he starts out the word, starts out the book with, with these words, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. Ready? Meaningless! Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors in which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, where they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. 
The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. This is a really good positive thinking lecture, isn't it? I mean, start out at the very beginning. The power of positive thinking. No, not, not really. It starts out the same. Meaningless. We have our own little walking, talking Ecclesiastes at home. True story. About a year or so ago, we were coming home, and <laughs> Grayson asked Jennifer, this is what she says, Mommy, yes, honey, the sun goes up, the sun goes down. The sun goes up, the sun goes down. Why this just happens? And me and Jim will look at each other and we're like, what? And we kind of brace them for the next day because I'm waiting for her to go, meaningless! <laughs> Everything is meaningless! And that's the joke around me, you know, around our house. And we'll start saying, the sun goes up, the sun goes down. Why does this happen? But Solomon, he, he takes a look at his life. And he, he points out all of the, the things in our life that really in the end, they're going to go away. Or it's just a cycle. It's just going to keep going. Like he says, everything that's been done will be done again. There's nothing new. He looks at his life and everything around him and sees how wearisome life can be. How much vanity is in the world. And he says, meaningless. It's his black box where Solomon opens up everything that happened and said, it's worth nothing. The word here is kabel. Yeah, you like it. In order to say that, you've got to get some phlegm behind you. You've got to hawk a a little bit. Got a, you know, Hebel. Can't just say Hebel because that's not Hebrew. You know, Hebel. The word he uses is, is Hebel, and it is translated here as meaningless. And Solomon uses it over 50 times in the book. Now, this word Hebel, the best illustration that I think can be done for the book, or for the, the word Hebel, uh, it's found in this bag right here. Now, there's, who's, who's received a gift recently in a, in a gift bag? Pretty much ever. Who's ever received a gift from a, in a gift bag? Everybody, right? 20 years ago, we didn't have these, right? I mean, you had to wrap it. And if you, been, you better wrap it good or else everybody's going to laugh at you at Christmas and birthday time. Somebody came along, probably a guy who can't wrap a gift, and said, what if we could just throw the gift in a bag? Hey, I'll call it a gift bag and make millions and millions of dollars. You know, we have these bags, and it's just kind of easy. You go to the store, you pick one out, or you, as in our case, you pull that bag out underneath your bed, pull one out that you save. You know, and you find the biggest bag for, like, the smallest gift. That's what I like to do. You know, you get like this gigantic bag, and then you get like this tiny little gift, and you throw it at the bottom. Or what I like to do is wrap it in tissue paper, throw it in the bag, and then cover it with tissue paper. So that's a, you know, it's a, it's a game, basically. But this is a, a gift bag, and the gift bag itself is not so special. You know what I mean? Yeah, this is a cute little pink polka dot, you know. Like, like I said earlier, this is the only one you're going to get from my house, because everything's pink. You'll see this or Minnie Mouse. But it's not the gift bag that really makes a difference. It's not the gift bag that makes it. Uh, appeal to people, to look uh, attractive. The, the, the thing about the gift bag is it's the paper. It's the paper that counts. You know, what do kids do when they get like, you just rip the paper off, the paper goes everywhere. The paper is what makes the bag, makes the gift. Because if you give somebody a gift with no paper in there on the bag, that's just tacky, right? Yeah, you know, it's like, oh wow, thanks for thinking of me. Couldn't you at least put some paper on top of it? <laughs> the paper is what makes the gift. The paper, when you pull it out, though, you realize there's nothing to it. There's nothing inside the bag if you take the paper out. This is chabel. Fluff. Nothing. It makes things look attractive, but in the end, it's trash. In the end, it ends up on the floor and all over the house on Christmas morning. And that's what Solomon says. Solomon says, I'm the wise man. I'm the wisest man walking the earth. Listen to me. Money? Hebel. What's it going to do for you in the end? You can't take it with you when you go. Hebel. It lands up on the floor. Power. Yeah, power. You can be the most powerful man in the world. You can be the king. And in the end, Hebel. Nothing. It's trash. Pleasure? Sure. Go ahead and have 300 wives or 700 wives and 300 concubines. Been there. Done that. I can tell you. Trash. Nothing. Kebel. It's fluff. 
There is no meaning behind it. You want to achieve, you want to reach for something, you, you know, we, we have this mentality of, if I could only just get that promotion, if I could only just get into this college, if I could only just marry this person, if I could just get that girl, if I could just get that guy, if I could just get this raise, if I could just get this house or this car, then, and Solomon says, it's all habel, trash, nothing, meaningless. It is a bunch of fluff that you pull out of your life and you realize at the end there was nothing in it. It was empty, that of a life. You know, the other thing about Havel is that you can spend all your time saving it, folding it up real nice, putting it in storage, and then you turn around and end up giving it to someone who could care less about it. And it ends up trash. You know, not to be uh, offensive, because I understand it, we've all been there. I don't know, I don't want to you know, offend anybody, but I remember four years ago when my granddaddy died, and he died in October. Well, it took my grandma me three months to go through everything he had. And in January of 2010, we all got together at her house, and you know, everything that was left was spread. She told she threw away three-fourths of the stuff that he had. And this was the leftovers. It was all spread out in the living room, I remember standing there and I looked around and I just thought to myself, this is where it all ends up. 69 years my granddaddy lived and everything that he had was piled in a room waiting for distribution. And we kind of walked around, of course, the kids got to go first. Adults. Uh, you know, us grandkids had to sit back and watch everything that we wanted got taken. But we wanted, the kids went, you know, his kids went first and then we got to go and we just kind of walked around and he just kind of picked around stuff and I'll take this and then I'll take that. And my grandma, she kept saying, well, what about this? What about this? You should take this. You should take this. And I remember my dad and my uncle and my aunt saying, but we don't, we don't really need that. You know, like, we just want this. She took two more car, load, car loads to go to And gave them. And I remember just sitting there thinking, this is where it all ends up. And you, and you save your whole life and you gather and you collect. We're dealing with this with our granny right now, with Jennifer's granny. That lady had so much stuff. I mean, there's just all kinds of nice trinkets, and now every time we go and see her, she's trying to give us something. Last time we were there, she tried to give us a china cabinet, and I was like, what? John, do we have anywhere to put a china cabinet in the house? No. How am I going to get it from Florida to here? Like, well, granny, we appreciate the thought, and so she's going to save it for us. So I'm like, I don't, we don't want a china cabinet. But every time we come, it's like, here, take this stuff, take this stuff, take this stuff. And all those car collections. Plaque collections, trophy collections, the ain't I wonderful walls that people have. Where does most of it end up? Garbage. Trash. I'm not trying to be offensive, but that's kind of what Solomon says. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And we say, well, isn't those things important? Yeah, those things are important. But see, Solomon has this wisdom moment where he says, all the treasures, all the belongings, all the possessions, all the pleasure, all the ladies, all of my power and everything, I've wasted it all. So I think that, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to stop here. I didn't even want to go to this lesson. I actually just wanted to end it last week. And, you know, because I ended eight minutes early last week. So that's, you know, the encouraging thing. You're like, yeah, y'all know we got a church at 11.22 last week. You're welcome. I wanted to end last week. <laughs> Don't expect it all. I wanted to end last week where you say that wisdom and passion go hand in hand. Let's end with follow God and, and be fine and led by your passion. Amen. Let's go out and change the world. But you, you can't stop there. Because Solomon doesn't stop there. And I believe that if we were going to fully look at Solomon's life, then we had to come to this. Open it up and see that as we live our lives for God, as we're trying to be servants, as we're trying to do His will, trying to live as the church, as we're looking forward and planning, we have to ask the question, have I spent all my time fussing with the paper? Have I spent all of my time wrestling with things that can be balled up very tiny, very small, and they're nothing? Have I wasted all of my time with this? Am I wasting all of my time with this? Because the truth is, yeah, a lot of times, this is what controls our life. You know, even as a church, 
When it comes to church things, we're too busy messing with this. The hebel. The meaningless. Have we been dealing with the paper and completely missing the blessings? And so you say, well, good grief. What matters then? What's important? You beat me up enough. What's the point? I mean, we're looking at Solomon. He gives this wise man at the end of his life. Give me something good. Give me that nugget of truth. Tell me, most wisest man in the world, what should I do? And Solomon says, okay, here it goes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 3, or verse uh, 13, sorry. At the very end of his book, at the very end of all of his treatment on the meaningless and the nothingless, he says, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. Yeah. We're standing here saying, Solomon, tell me what to do. Give it to me. Come on, man. You are God. You, you, you're right next to God. You've got words from God. He can give you wisdom. Tell me how to live my life. He says, okay. Fear God and keep his commandments. Question. That's it? That's all you have to tell me is fear God. I was kind of expecting something deeper. Something a little bit more insightful. You know, fear God. Is that all? And Solomon would say, what else do you need? What else do you need besides fear God? Because if you knew who God was, the creator of the universe, who spoke everything into being, who simply said, let it be, and it was, the judge of heaven and earth, who Solomon says in the last line of his book, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. If you knew who God was, the ultimate judge, then you would fear the Lord. Amen? Amen. You would, and not this, oh, I'm so scared of God, you know, cowering. It is this reverent, reverential bowing before him and saying, you are so definitely God, and I am so definitely not. Because of who you are and what you do. Thomas says, if you knew who God was, you would fear him. Respect him. Put him first. Pay attention when he speaks. Listen to his word. And then keep his commandments. Question. Which commandments? Isn't that what we kind of like to do? Well, okay, so which part should we keep? God says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey what I teach you. We like to say, which part of all that should we keep? And Solomon says, well, for that answer, I'm going to turn you over to another king, the king of kings. And Jesus steps onto the world stage, and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law, all of the prophets, all of the psalms, all of the commandments, everything is brought into these two commandments. And so we start with a wise young man who seeks God's wisdom, but his passion leads him astray through a thousand dark nights and days, and we end up with an old guy. An old guy who, you know, kind of like the old guy on your street. You might have an old guy on your street. I won't ask you if you are the old guy on the street. But you know, there's that guy on your street that he's always outside doing something. He's out there always trimming the bushes or, you know, sometimes just doing nothing. We've got that guy on our street. He is always outside. Matter of fact, a lot of us asked me the other day, why is that man just always outside in his yard? And I was like, I don't know, sweetie. He's always doing something. He was sitting on his porch doing something, you know, but he always ways. I remember my, uh, my, my Paul Paul. I mean, my great grandfather. Uh, he lived right next door to where my grandma currently lives, and, and he was always out in the yard. Every time he drove by, he'd go to grandma's house. He's outside, he'd leave that and everything. Well, then when he couldn't walk hardly, he couldn't get out of the house, he positioned his chair right in front of the door. And he'd open the door, and there's the screen door, and he'd watch as the cars come by. And he always did what we call the Paul Paul wave. He'd always wave like this. That's how he waved to everyone. That was always known as the Curtis Matthew wave. He'd wave just like that. 
And I remember every time we drive out, we had to slow down the pawpaw's house so that he could do the pawpaw wave, and we do the pawpaw wave back at him. But he's always, you know, he's always noticing you. Well, you know, I kind of look at Solomon. It's kind of like that old guy who's standing out in his yard as my car is passing by. Him. And he's waving at me. And he's saying, friend, it's not the yard that matters. It's not the bushes and the flowers. It's not the house. It's not the car. It's not what's sitting in your yard. It's not the money. It's not the clothes. It's not what you can accumulate or what you can accomplish. Those, that's not what matters. It's about God. That is what he says. Everything is meaningless if God is not at the center of it. Everything we do, everything we're working for, if God is not at the center of our lives, it's kebel. It's trash that ends up on the floor on Christmas morning. That's for us personally. <coughs> That's for us as a church. God's not at the center of it. It works. If God is not at the center of our Sunday morning worship service, <coughs> it's a waste of time. If God is not at the center of any form of outreach that we do, it's meaningless. If we are at the center of anything, this is what it is. Solomon says, honor God. Keep His commandments. Then, you will be wise. So I asked you this morning, are you caught up in the paper? Are you drowning in the paper? Are you lost in the chabel and the worthlessness and the meaningless? Maybe today is the day that you quietly say in your heart, I'm going to put Him first. I'm going to trash all this paper, and it's time that I start listening to the Lord and passionately love others and love God. The message is yours this morning. If you need the support or encouragement or prayers of this church family, let us know if we can start together. Thanks.